This video will talk about some of the bad assumptions and how we can spot them when we do regression. This example would be a violation of the linear relationship. That is, the data are not linear, but we're trying to use something like simple linear regression to understand trends. And so this would be how a plot would look. Imagine we have the fitted values on the, the x-axis from our regression, and we have the residual values on the y-axis. And so this would indicate a violation of the linear relationship. It's clear that there is a nonlinear trend in the residual plot. Some fixes might be polynomial regression or some kind of nonlinear regression. So if we see a residual plot that looks like this, we know that we've violated the linear relationship. Here's a popular one that we often see in statistics. This idea of a megaphone pattern in your residual plots would violate the assumption of constant variance. That is, the dispersion of the residuals increases for larger values of x. There's also a big $5 word for this finding, and this is called heteroscedasticity. And so one way to remedy this is to think about transforming your data somehow so that you can then use the concepts of regression and use the assumptions of regression and move forward with your data analysis. And so the violation of constant variance is a common one we often see when we work with data and statistics. So what kinds of transformations might be available? Well, transforming your data in general can be a way to remedy the problem of non-constant variance. So here are a few tips. We can take a square root of any data set. This works really well when all the values of y that you're interested in are uh, greater than zero, that is, they're positive. And it also works well with count data. Think about the number of warblers we might see if we were to go out birding. We could take the logarithm of the data. This is also widely used. It happens when you have positive values greater than zero. And you could do the logarithm transformation on both the independent variable and possibly the dependent variable in your regression. We could take a reciprocal as a transformation. Instead of yi, let's take 1 divided by yi. This can be used for non-zero data, which is ap applicable in many studies. We can take the arc sine transformation of a data point. This is really commonly used on proportions, any values between 0 and 1. The arc sine transformation tends to work well. The important thing to know is that when you transform the data, the good thing about doing that is that you can often now meet the assumptions of regression. But the downside of doing that is interpreting the results can be a little bit more difficult. And so oftentimes, especially if you transform the y variable or the response variable in your regression, you're going to have to back transform it so that you're talking in the same units that everyone knows about your variables of interest. And so for an example, you wouldn't say, uh, I went out and measured corn and found a logarithm of 0.5 bushels per acre. Well, instead you want to report whatever the value is in bushels per acre, whether that's 190 or, or whatever. Uh, and so it's important to understand that you can transform data but you also probably will have to back transform it into the, its original units. We also can have a violation of normality. And in this example, we observe just a few residuals that stand out from the rest. So in this case, we have one data point that's clearly away from all of the others in the data. So some of the ways to fix this are to do things like try other regression techniques. Or maybe just check your data entry. It's not uncommon to get simple data errors when they're entered or when they're cataloged uh, into some electronic system that goes wrong. Uh, and so it's good to check the data or to look at other regression techniques. A good plot that will that you'll be able to see data points like this is the QQ plot. The QQ plot is a great way to test for normality. So you'll remember we've seen a few of these in class, but they plot the kth 
smallest observation against the expected value of the kth smallest observation. And so the idea here is that for any mean and any standard deviation, you would expect a straight line to form if the data were distributed normally. That is, you'd expect a straight line from the bottom left to the top right of the curve. If it is straight, we are confident that we don't have a serious violation of the normality assumption, and then we're pretty confident in the results that we obtain. So how might we do this in R? Well, in R, if you're using something like LM, and LM is the function that does a linear model or performs a simple linear regression on a data set, you can just say plot, and then whatever that R object is from your linear model output, and that'll produce a bunch of residual graphs. And so you'll be able to assess the concepts of normality and some of the other assumptions. Now, what we're going to provide you in class is a customized function called diagplot that allows you to use ggplot to make all of these diagnostic plots. It'll be a handy function that we'll use often in the remainder of this class. Now, about that last assumption, we need to make sure that our data are measured without error. Now, I've put here a couple examples to worry about if your data are measured without error, and a couple of other examples to recognize, but just move on. And so some examples to worry about, well, you might have lat long coordinates that are off by a mile. You might be conducting a study on microsite characteristics of a forest where you really should know the exact spot where that's located. And so you might say then that your data are not measured without error. You might not know if the data are collected in English or metric units. That's one I've encountered in the past. You might have faulty equipment used in data collection that's not giving you consistent readings. In those cases, those are examples to worry about. Well, what about if your GPS is only accurate to within one meter and you're conducting a study on the microsite characteristics of forest? Well, in that case, maybe we're okay with having one meter accuracy in calculating or determining that level of precision. And maybe your data were collected in some units, but you converted them to some other units, and that's okay. Uh, in that case, uh, our data are not erroneous, uh, but we just need to recognize uh, how we got the data that we're working with. And then finally, I really encourage you to know your data before you analyze it. And so there are lots of organizations that list the quality assurance and quality control policies. Uh, folks like the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, Canada Agri-Food, the U.S. Forest Service, the USDA, um, all of them list and have some great detail on what kind of data quality you can expect. As one example, in the forest inventory and analysis data set, their minimum quality uh, that they have for many of their variables is that they measure, say, one, one example like tree diameter correctly at least 95% of the time. And that is they want to be within plus or minus 0 0.1 inches for every 20 inches of increment measured of diameter on all live trees and dead trees. So that's just one example of one specific measurement that is out there. And so in doing this, uh, you uh, should be able to uh, understand and to review the quality assurance and quality control protocols for your field. It's really important to understand the quality of the data before you start analyzing it and doing and performing regressions on it.